title of this talk is towards a measure of the optimization of natural file systems. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a master's student on the uh, evolution of language and cognition course. Um, so really I'm coming at this from a sort of more evolutionary angle, but it's quite phonetic, so that's why I'm kind of grouped with the phonetics people. Um, so, okay, so starting out with the idea that the uh, set of vowels in a language tend to be organized in such a way that they're kind of maximally distinctive from one another. Um, and computational simulations uh, of the evolution of vowel spaces um, show that self-optimization promotes um, optimal vowel systems. And, but there's been little investigation into the typological description of vowel space optimization across the world's languages. So we don't know, for example, whether, say, Swahili is more or less optimized than, say, English. And answering that question could have sort of implications for evolutionary linguistics in the sense that we could say, you know, if this language is very optimized, maybe there's some kind of underlying linguistic or social reason for that. Um, so yeah, so the aims of this research was to show that uh, it's possible to measure the optimization of vowel systems. So to sort of take a set of vowels and just you know t change it into a single number that says you know this is how organized the system is, and um, to show that it could have practical uses within evolutionary linguistics and the study of language more generally. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly outline how the method works in sort of four steps, and then go into more detail about it. Uh, so we start out by measuring the form and frequencies of the vowels um, in a particular language. Um, and then we plot the vowels in a, in a perceptual vowel space. Um, and then we calculate the potential energy in the system uh, using the uh, inverse square law from theoretical physics, which is arguably not necessarily applicable to language, but it seems to sort of work. Um, and then finally, uh, Monte Carlo techniques to measure the non-randomness of the system. Okay, so um, there's not really a whole bunch of data out there that sort of, uh, of the, like for the form and frequencies of loads of languages. So I kind of had to just go and do loads of form and measurements manually. Um, so my data comes from uh, the UCLA Phonetics Lab archive, which is a sort of uh, online archive of something like two or three hundred uh, languages from around the world. They've got audio recordings; you can download them and then do your own uh, acoustic analysis. Um, so I chose a sample of 100 languages, just selected at random, and used the uh, Prad software application to extract and measure the form and frequency uh, data. So this is uh, a, a map showing geographical distribution of languages in the sample. Um, so you can see it's pretty well spread across the world. There's no particular focus on European languages, for example. Um, and so we take the uh, the uh, or the recording into Prat, and we look at the spectrogram like this. Um, so this is the uh, Banawa language from South America. It's the word Ibofa to dump into water. Um, so basically what we want to do is just measure the, the form and frequency of the vowels. So we've got F1 here, F2 here, F3 here. Thankfully, Prat can just figure that out for me and mm -hmm. output all the, the, the numbers that I need. Um, so the cool thing is now when you put this, when you plot this into, into a plot that looks like this with reverse log axes, what you get is this kind of representation of how the vowels relate to each other within, within a sort of two-dimensional space. Um, so the front vowels are at the front, the back vowels are back, and, and so on. Um, now what we want to be able to do is to, to kind of measure how these vowels relate to each other. Now because this is, um, because the way we perceive vowels is kind of logarithmic, we need to transform the form and frequencies into a, a linear scale. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of scales out there. I chose the MEL scale um, just because it was the most, or the, the least computationally expensive. So when you, tr when you transform the vowels into the MEL scale, you get something that looks basically exactly the same, but you've got linear dimensions, which makes it possible to measure the Euclidean distance between the vowels. Um, so, okay, measuring the distance between them, say so you've got two vowels, mm -hmm. I and J. Uh, so the distance D we want to measure is like this. Uh, it's just a simple Pythagoras' uh, theorem, um, which basically says what's the length of the hypotenuse given this imaginary triangle. Um, so, yeah, so once we've got the distance, we can. it's possible to calculate the, the energy in a, in a 
old system. So Lillenkrantz and Lindblom from 1972 um, used this uh, method to figure out how optimized computationally um, simulated valve systems were. So what they were doing is just starting out with a random set of valves and then like moving one of them a little bit. And if it was more optimized, they'd keep the new distribute or the new organization. If it's less, then they go back and start again. And eventually, after loads of iterations, you get something that's quite um, quite well optimized and looks like natural languages. Um, so to kind of understand how the inverse square law, law works, um, you can sort of imagine there's two particles, and um, if they've got equal charge, and they sort of repel each other, but when they're close, they push really hard, and when they're far apart, the, the, the force is much weaker. So this is just a little diagram that kind of illustrates that. Um, so as you increase the distance from the source, the, the force it becomes weaker. Um, so if your two particles are confined to a space, they'll uh, move apart until their mutual distance is maximized. And the optimal state is the one in which the potential energy in the system is minimized, uh, which is the inverse of the square of the distance between the particles. I'm going to explain this in a bit more detail in a second. Um, so, but if we assume that this a similar kind of process occurs in the emergence of valve systems, then um, we can measure the potential energy in a in a valve space with this formula, which just says take the distance between two valves, uh, take the square, take the inverse, sum it all up for all the possible pairings, which um, kind of looks something like this. So this is the Basque language, um, which has got this sort of beautifully symmetrical valve system. Um, and what we want to do is basically just, for each pairing of valves, measure the distance, take the square, take the inverse, and, and record the uh, value. And then once we've done that, we just uh, sum them all up. We get this, and this is basically the amount of energy in this particular system. <coughs> so when we've got a low level of energy, that means we've got a highly optimized valve space. Basically, we want to invert that number. Uh, to this, which tells us how optimized the system is, um, in a kind of loose sense of the word optimized, I guess. Um, so finally, we want to standardize the measure across individuals. And I've done this using uh, Monte, a Monte Carlo method. Uh, so for, for each of the languages, we generate 100,000 random vowel sets. So each one has the same number of vowels, constrained by the same size space. Um, and then we calculate a standard score by comparing the natural language against the mean and standard deviation of the randomized ones. Um, and then we get a, a standard score, which is where if it's greater than zero, it suggests the valves are further apart than expected by chance. Um, OK, so this is the Farsi language. Let's kind of demonstrate how this works. Um, we start out by calculating the energy in the Farsi system, which is this. And then we produce just a random system by uh, picking points at random on each, or numbers at random on each dimension, plotting the points. The energy in the random system is this. So you can see right away that the, the randomized system has much lower kind of optimization units um, compared to the natural one. And then we run another randomization again, calculate the energy in that one, and then we do this like thousands of times. Um, keeping track of how much energy is in each of these systems. And eventually, we sort of converge on a kind of mean. So in this case, around 2,800 is, is representative of a typical randomized language of the same sort of vowel, a set of vowels. Um, so next, what we can kind of show how this works, we sort of look at the distribution of the randomized languages. And so what you see is the really unoptimized ones, there's few of those. The really highly optimized ones, there's not very many of those. And really, it's kind of concentrated in the middle in this normal distribution, um, which is, so basically what we're seeing is that the typical random languages are around, around here. And our natural language, Farsi, is right out here. So you know this kind of shows you that it's really unlikely to have been generated by chance. So there's something about Farsi that makes it special. It's, it's, it's emerged in some sort of um, selective way. Um, so finally, just to measure how non-random Farsi is compared to the randomizations, we take the standard deviation of the randomized sample and then compute the z-score. So it's about 3.8 standard deviations to the right of the randomized sample. Okay, so this method captures the two key properties 
of an optimized system, effectiveness on, on order. So the inverse square law tells us how effective or how perceptually distinctive the distribution of bounds is, uh, given the finite space in which they exist. And the application of Monte Carlo techniques tell us how ordered or non-random the Bell system is by comparing the natural system against systems known to be uh, stochastic in nature. Okay, so the results. So I found there was a high degree of variation in how optimized Bell spaces are. And on the one hand, you get really unoptimized languages like Azerbaijani, where it's actually a negative set score, so it's actually more random than random something. Um, and then on the, other, on the other end of the scale, you've got something like uh, Nyangumata, which is got a really high Z score, so it's very unlikely that you would get that sort of distribution of bounds by chance. Um, optimization, so the optimization number inversely correlates with the inventory size. So as you get more vows, the amount of, opt you know, the, you get less optimized systems. Um, so yeah, so that's just something that. So to look at like some examples of what these look like, this is like all the three valve systems in the sample. So at the top left, you can see the most optimized ones down to the, the least optimized ones at the bottom right. Um, and you can sort of see if you look through them, you can see how as they get closer together, they, you know, they're becoming less optimized and that's reflected in the, in the number at the top. Um, so this is the same thing again for the mm -hmm. five valve systems. Again, you can see on top left, you've got the most optimized, down to the bottom right where you've got the least optimized systems. Uh, and then got the same thing again here for the seven, uh, seven bar systems and the nine bar systems. Um, okay, so an interesting application for English linguistics is: um, do, do the bar does the amount of optimization in these bar systems correlate with other linguistic or social properties? Um, so here in Bauer, two thousand seven, showed there's a positive correlation between inventory size and speaker population size. And I wanted to test whether I could maybe get something like um, a correlation between uh, vowel system optimization and speaker population size controlling for um, controlling for inventory size. Um, no, nothing significant came out, no matter what way I kind of diced the data. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean there is no possible positive link. But in, I was kind of thinking maybe something like if you've got a small sort of tightly knit community. Maybe they can rely more on context, so they sort of you don't really need an optimized, well-organized system. Maybe something like that, but I couldn't really find anything along those lines. Um, so although there's no significant interaction, it kind of illustrates the kind of things that you could do with this kind of measure with more uh, in-depth analysis. Uh, okay, um, so yeah, the strength, the strengths of the research, uh, the. Optimization score does kind of seem to intuitively fit with what you would expect a sort of optimized and an unoptimized valve space to look like. Um, the and the results show there's a, a tendency towards um, optimized organizations of valves, which is implicitly assumed by kind of simulations. So a lot of these sort of simulations of the emergence of valve systems sort of say, let's run a simulation and see. We can, how we can make like the most optimized system, but maybe in the real world, maybe the file systems aren't actually as optimized as we kind of assume they might be, because some of them seem to be very sort of messy and, and stuff. Um, and also the uh, results could be useful in like typological type studies, um, which is where we can see if maybe uh, the optimization of file systems um, interacts with other, other kinds of properties. Uh, okay, so the challenges with the research, uh, the, the raw data in the study are inherently fuzzy, so speakers don't consistently produce vowels with the same um, formant qualities. Um, and this, I guess this could be problems because if you just sort of rely on one particular token, and then you might find that that's kind of a bit misleading, because maybe in other linguistic environments you might get different kind of patterns or something like that. So I think you know you need a much bigger data set um, to do more in-depth analysis. Um, there's a guy in uh, at uh, UCLA who's actually been, this is actually something that James pointed out to me a month ago or something. There's a guy, um, he's collecting this big sort of corpus of information about, about, uh, about like phonological systems from around the world, including like the form frequencies. 
So it'd be really useful, it'd be really cool to like have that kind of data and, and see if we can get more kind of accurate observations. Um, also, the, the simulations that I'm running are assuming a priori that the, uh, the bows of the natural language delineate the maximum space available, um, which could introduce some kind of ceiling effects when you're, when you're comparing against the randomized ones. Um, so that's something I'm trying to figure out, figure out at the moment. Um, and also, it's, it's currently difficult to make comparisons between languages of, di of different inventory sizes because the, the score, the sort of final result, is not really inventory size neutral. That's something I'm also trying to figure out. Okay, uh, my main conclusions. Uh, the research has demonstrated a method for measuring the level of optimization of perceptual mouse spaces of natural languages, which could be of use to future linguistic research. Uh, and further work will be required to improve on the method and could have practical implications for understanding how vowel systems evolve in order to adapt to changing environmental, social, and cognitive demands. Thanks. saying that there is no typological evidence for, from a, a large number of languages on these for the telling, but that's precisely what Roy Becker Crystal has yeah. um, has done. It's over 300 languages. Uh, it's it's acoustic data, and as so one of the um, uh, oh yeah, I said uh, uh, one of the results he has is that when you get more more um, elements in the inventory, the 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 space gets bigger. Is, is, is that something that I haven't looked at that. That would be interesting, actually. Um, I could definitely just get the data out for that quite easily. So yeah, that would be quite something that would be quite interesting to look at. Yeah. That's, that's one possible. of the ways in which dispersion theory kind of yeah. can be done. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. Like the 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 amount of space that you use is not really is kind of relevant. That'd be interesting if the amount of space you use is relevant to the number of vowels in the system. That would be quite interesting, but. Um, if you've got a small system, you're not going to just by default use all the space possible. You're kind of using a subset of that space. That would already give you a low, uh, I don't know, a low energy value. Yeah, yeah. Oh, although the when I when I standardize it then in the in the Monte Carlo, because I'm taking the kind of space that's actually delineated by the, the natural system itself, it kind of normalizes for that kind of that problem. Okay. So I guess that's what I was going to ask is, can, can't you just normalize by the number of number of vowels in the system or something like that in order to normalize those? Um, I, I, I did start out doing that, yeah. yeah. And then it kind of wasn't really working out. And so then I ended up doing this Monte Carlo stuff instead. But I mean, but just to get the raw. So you would take the energy and then just divide by the number of. I mean, that would normalize. I mean, I guess you have to look at how you're, you know, how you're actually calculating the energy score on the budget to make sure that wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, I think Roy did something like this. Yeah, he did a lot of corrections for Yeah, he did some kind of to put them in the Right, because he, yeah, he also wanted to, I mean, I don't remember the details, but I remember he wanted to be able to sort of look at things like size of the inventory and properties of the inventory. Like, does it make more use of that one or more use of that two and making distinctions? Does that correlate somehow with. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still, I've just actually started Roy's thesis, so I'm kind of going through it at the moment, so yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff in it. Hi. So, um, in later work by Lynn Bloom, he points out that F, the F1 dimension is weighted more heavily than the F2 dimension because it's louder. So, have you, are you planning on incorporating I that kind of thing in your I haven't looked at that. Um, I guess I guess you could, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could correct for that. You could just measure the, the loudness of the, of the vowel and then, you know, correct for that in some way. but. I haven't, I haven't looked at that, no. Yeah, so it went in 1986. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll have a look at that one, yeah. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, so, uh, about the questions that have already come up. So, so you said that your, that your measure just doesn't, what, so it, does, it doesn't give you the same results for, for inventories with a different uh, number of vowels. So I was just wondering, so is that is that an artifact of the measure that you're using, or is that actually something that you find? Because, you, you know, if you, if, even if you think of this sort of bigger inventory as being more spread out, taking up a larger amount of space, you know, if, if that's the case, then that, that if, if your measure is indeed 
not that correlated with this, then that would mitigate this effect. But if, if you have to cram a larger number of vowels into the same amount of space, then indeed you would find, I think, the effect that, that you have put there as a significant correlation. Um, so with the, um, I think there is possibly an artifact in the measure. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is if you've got a lot of vowels in a system, then when you do the Monte Carlo stuff, you're going to get a greater standard deviation because um, because you've got this kind of because you've got more vowels in the system. There's more possibility for more possible ways for it to be for the space to be organized, and therefore you get these more variants. You get these bigger standard deviations, which in turn gives you the smaller Z score. So possibly that's an artifact that, in, that kind of it could explain why why that's the case. Right. That's something that I'm trying to kind of work out. But I'm not really sure where to go with that. But in this, so we're actually comparing though that the, the, the isn't it the you're comparing the the energy score that you get out of the randomization, right? Yeah. Or, or the inverse of the energy. Right. Is it and the, the energy score on its own is not actually dependent on the number of I think I might have looked at that. I can't really remember. The reason I had to do the Monte Carlo side was to s kind of standardize it across individuals yeah, yeah. because you get these. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the question. That, I mean, that's what I would hope to answer if you could take this a bit further. You know, what what is it about Azerbaijani that makes it, you know, not want to be optimized? <laughs> just on the just on the vowels. There must be some well, other aspect. Of yeah, I mean, yeah, it's possible it could be made made up in some way. But, but you said that there's sometimes the the sample size is very small, and so you're. Did, sorry, I, I thought you were saying at, at one point that that you might have accidentally taken valves. Yes. You know, measurements from very different phonological environments. So yeah. maybe it's not a real reflection of the, of the mean values. Yeah, of that's the that, that's definitely possible. What I would like to have done is taken a lot more tokens of yeah. each vowel, but then yeah. you end up with thousands yeah. and thousands of sticks too long. So yeah. I had to do kind of quickly to kind yeah. of get this. Kind so it's possible idea. that Azerbaijan is it one of the languages where, where your I measurements have yeah, uh, you know, yeah. errors yeah, in, in comparison to the yeah. normal, yeah. normal, normal, normal yeah. But if we assume that they're roughly right across all of them, then mm -hmm. yeah. this is kind of... Um. So it would be strange. <laughs> it's more random than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that it's more random because it's, it's, it has vowels or less spaced out than our they, 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 they couldn't, yeah. yeah. So they're clustered yeah. rather than Welsh. I yeah. remember this, the shape is looking a bit yeah. thick. Yeah. Five? Was it five or six? Right? Azerbaijani, I think it was, I think it's about, I think it's quite a few, like nine or something. Oh. Like that. Right. You also might just be able to extend, I mean, by taking that, it, you might, since you're just looking at vowels, you might be able to try some sort of forced alignment on more of that UCLA phonetic data mm -hmm. to just try and you'll still have some errors, but it will be rather than a hand going through yeah, yeah. all of them, you could at least extract yeah, yeah, more data, sort of less. That might be less one error. way to sort of mitigate against some. Yeah, of I think that that's probably the way forward. Hi, Say that again, sorry? Sorry, balance of frequency and speed. Really? Um, that's, yeah, I think that could definitely have an effect. And if you, if you want to kind of do correlational studies, you know, you'd have to kind of figure out exactly what the kind of interactions are, I guess, mm -hmm. and figure out what you want to control for. Um, I mean, this is kind of, this would be like a lot more down the line if I was to take this further. But yeah, that's that would be something interesting to look at. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. So the conference resumes at...